China, Japan, and Europe are analyzed over 2,500 years, shows how religio-ecological movements get paired against chosen forms of state-led environmental degradation in a predictable fashion. The book describes solutions to this durable problematic as well. It should be useful for <coughs> all people seeking solutions, or at least debates upon different practices for environmental problems. I have a separate PowerPoint dealing with this other book, uh, and some MP3 lectures if you're curious. Moving to the core of the talk, uh, paper summary, everything I underline is moving to a new section. First, a background on bioregionalism. The political, cultural, and environmental system based on naturally defined areas called bioregions, or later ecoregions. The term was invented in the 1970s. Bioregions are defined through physical and environmental features, including watershed boundaries and soil and terrain characteristics. Bioregionalism stresses that the determination of a bioregion is often a cultural phenomenon and emphasizes local populations, knowledge, and solutions. Ergo, is a political interest. And a bioregional state idea is a framework of larger, meaning a green constitutional engineering for multiple bioregional interactions and conflict resolution, as well as avoiding elite gatekeeping, as well as small, the bioregional, ecoregional, or watershed forms of nested politics and ecological checks and balances with each other development. Um, three useful terms uh, for this comparative historical perspective developed over a long period of time. You might argue for an ecological self-interest in world history from particular regions. The bioregional term represents something far more durable uh, continuity uh, in different regions in opposition to each other as well as to particular state regions. Uh, ecological tyranny as well as ecological contrast. Uh, ecological self-interest might be the durable concern of people's self-interest in environmental issues of their multiple regions, sometimes disorganized from being active and intentionally disorganized by state elites, and sometimes organized and actively expressing this self-interest ecologically. This is completely against Hardin's conception of an individual selfishness yielding environmental difficulties. Such things as individual selfish degradation are politically held in place and hegemonically protected through particular institutions elite gatekeeping, and ideologies against feedback instead of seeing this as natural economics. Moreover, self-interest has been defined restrictively as simply short-term individual economic gain instead of a politicized ecological self-interest of a region of durable ecological health and economics combined with certain population. This is closer, of course, to Eleanor Ostrom's view of real-world examples of individuals and communities changing the degraded rules of the game voluntarily toward environmental improvements as a form of individual self-interest instead of somehow against individual self-interest. Uh, the second term, ecological tyranny. If that's ecological self-interest, this is what is typically opposed to integrating this into state politics. The delocalized territorial state elite pressures keeping local ecological self-interest from being organized. This is inclusive of passive gatekeeping and of active repression. As you can see, expression of local political economic organizational priorities combined with environmental priorities by a different development of choices. An ecological tyranny maintains a politics that encourages elite led environmental degradation, very delocalized in profits, delocalized jurisdiction, consumptive consolidation, economic shakeout towards singular materials, and ever mounting local externalities without legal or political recourse to change elite developmental priorities. In practice, a definition of ecological tyranny is a chosen form of informal politics and bad materials, knitted informally through formal political, economic, scientific, and financial organizational support that enforces environmental degradation and protects the bad material choices from being removed, whether by politics or by market forces, respectively by gatekeeping by corrupt politicians. If you don't like the word corrupt, you might substitute politicians that represent a certain material instead of uh, preserving choice, and gatekeeping by demoting consumer materials and technological options that already exist. Uh, detailed later, this implies a politicized consumptive infrastructure in institutional practices across states, scientific institutions, financial organizations, and consumptive organizations. And this is not with the idea, similar to Polanyi, who's been mentioned, where somehow the market has escaped politics. I'm arguing this you know, is just, just a different form of politics. It could be either representative or unrepresented, and it would modulate those four areas in institutional practices quite, quite differently and by choosing different materials or supporting them. 
the ecological contract and the implication of how you would solve these uh, dynamics of tyranny or ecological self-interest. It implies two issues. One, the states were re should be required to structurally facilitate a context that removes this degraded gatekeeping of elites around their bad material choices, and the states are required to enhance the organizing and participatory framework of particular geographic regions concerning environmental risk experienced by these bad material choices. They fail to do this, this is the comparative history coming in. They contribute, I argue, to an environmental, political, and cultural process of their own self-destruction. The terms together for ecological tyranny work against the ecological self-interest and the ecological contract to mask them and to ignore them. The gatekeep against the while state-led environmental degradation and crony uh, degraded material choices are protected and subsidized instead. Uh, the book is meant to start three different debates. One, a debate on the details of green constitutional engineering, coin phrase. Uh, the book includes over 60 different novel ecological checks and balances. A uh, debate also in the suggestions for slow implementation. We've discussed strategy before. This is discussed in one section of the conclusion. And a debate on knowledge application for sustainability from comparative historical research uh, instead of only modernist construction, neglected in environmental sociology. Uh, and the third debate on the knowledge application from comparative history. Uh, one main theme that continues to come up and that I found a useful organizing method. Uh, it's very similar to Mull and Spargarden's idea of environmental flows, uh, but I would like to add the idea of that, like politicized material flows, in a particular one versus others in the same category, where you have an unrepresentative or elite centric political clientelism, which is maintained through the choices of materials and ideology and how they change over time. Uh, quote, I argue as a result that a more representative form of materials organization would integrate anti systemic political feedback that is ignored, that is seen connected to long-term patterns of environmental problems that build towards a state breakdown. Um, the ethno-mechanical diversity, maintenance, and the regional maintenance is key in the bioregional state motif. Um, the bioregional state applies this to novel checks and balances in green constitutional engineering instead of only informal checks and balances in Enlightenment uh, era forms. I argue we need a uh, new level to deal with the gatekeeping frameworks, which are the top three as well as to integrate ecological checks and balances from below. Methodologically, this compared historical work as using an inductive analysis of material ideological consumption in particular flows. Uh, instead of one based on mere philosophical consumptions, whether from Marx or Smith, is based on aggregate case observations of many different particular consumptive flows and human behavior, particularly institutional choices, in relation to them as the basis of theory, instead of using inductive timeless theories of economics about various abstracts. Um, we have no time to discuss this, but I'm available later. You might call it Marxism with micro foundation. Um, five interrelated terms dealing with this uh, would be politicized consumptive infrastructure, previously described, and environmental definition of the state as a contentious regime, uh, politicized material flows created by institutional practices and decisions of states scientific consumptive and financial institutional sites, raw material substrates, one that is chosen, sometimes a choice to maintain a plurality, with institutional conflicts organizing around certain material choices and their institutional allies versus other material choices and their institutional allies, and that is quite easy to follow in historical record or precedent. Raw material substrate set, this is a set of choices for a particular well-defined consumptive use of which I believe there will be about 90 different natural market categories, this is constantly adapting, in which these conflicts occur. In other words, the conflict within energy or solar, nuclear, coal, wood. Uh, you have different sociological representatives uh, for different ones. Raw material regimes is a term which is very closely connected to the ecological tyranny. These are the informal and formal operation of power through material clientelism expressed in institutional choices and institutional alliances of choices that forbears against markets and consumer choices. Um, let's move on to the next section. As I said, these five terms, I argue, is a bare minimum of understanding uh, methodologically what I mean by ecological tyranny. Here's an image uh, which I drew as a heuristic to illustrate this idea of politicized material flows between four different areas. Um, this is an earlier drawing of different material categories. Uh, the comparative historical background, which I'm not continuing to discuss here, but I'm arguing a probabilistic, voluntary political process. 
that the state elites choose activities towards slow and formal elite consumptive consolidation and economic shakeout of the territory at large, and this is leading to environmental degradation and state breakdown. Uh, some states choose better than others. Moving to the state, main section of the talk, there is four informal and two informal uh, additions highlighted as an introduction to the 60 additional checks and balances. First, the four formal institutional additions highlighted, and I will summarize these as time permits. Um, watershed voting districts, proportional representation with majoritarian allotments. I'll describe what that long phrase means in a moment. Uh, flexible executive in interaction, we'll describe that in a minute. And nested watershed based court jurisdiction. The point is how they work together to remove these ideas of informal ecological tyranny and gatekeeping politics. <coughs> though each individually would be a huge improvement. Uh, the first one, watershed voting districts. Watersheds are biophysically real lines separating different drainage basins. Drainage basins concentrate more than water. Since when pollution risk is waterborne, watersheds represent areas where common environmental risk experiences exist. Now, therefore, watershed election districts should be the durable form of environmental risk feedback in state politics. Uh, the publicly desired neutral, nonpartisan way of drawing election boundaries has positive effects on party competition by removing gerrymandering to create truly representative parties. And gerrymandering is a fascinating area for environmental sociologists to look into in environmental politics. Uh, parties should compete to represent people's interests, not simply win by default because of the incumbents have uh, created their own voters. Uh, serving environmental issues serves competitive party issues and removes party corruption and districting. And I argue historically this can be seen as ecological self-interest ideas. There is an image, of course, of the watershed with water falling towards the middle. And if we move back out, here is what most of the world looks like. Here's an image of northern Texas, where the straight lines don't matter at all to the forms of pollution and uh, local environmental risk politics, uh, forms of nested frameworks. And here is a few examples of U.S. gerrymandered districts in some way, which are not very party competitive, and only been one person, one vote for the past 30, 60, or 70 years. The second issue is debate over representation within districts. So if we have these in place, the um, second debate is over whether multi-member districts or multi-majoritarian districts would provide stability. However, as political scientists know, there are difficulties with either as pure types. So I offer a compromise by suggesting that flexible seating be institutionalized depending on the election outcome. If uh, district votes more than 50% for one candidate, then obviously one person should be seated according to reflect the result. Uh, for district votes for only a plurality winner, then the top three multiple winners should be seated with a direct percentage of the vote seat, accurately to represent the same result of the majority, as well as since voters in this case want multiple people representing them. This flexible seating puts the decision in each election in the hands of people, uh, and is achieved by PRMA. Both structural outcomes are options that simultaneously work the check and balance on the bias of each. Um, it also encourages smaller parties as well debate over executive power versus legislative power. So if there's two levels of gatekeeping removed, we have a third debate uh, between the executive versus the legislature. And I suggest another merge solution in a flexible executive arrangement where the outcome of voting determines the structure, whether it be presidential or parliamentary. I'm skipping forward. This um, is a solution to what Juan Lentz and other comparative political sociologists have argued as uh, state breakdown of potentials by uh, the presidential or parliamentary. Debate over judicial power versus executive legal power. So if there's three levels of districting, uh, gatekeeping removed, then the fourth debate is the relative power of the judiciary against the executive branch. And the basic point is uh, a prime jurisdiction for local watershed issues would be local. Um, it's a framework of formal ecological tyranny to allow, as the U.S. does, for instance, BP to request that it move all environmental court suits out of the most toxic areas down to a judge in Texas, which is quite legal right now, um, who is connected to the oil industry very clearly. So, let me move forward. The two other informal institutional additions to wrap up. One uh, is a way to organize a watershed of ecological self-interest that's more than a form of political feedback that organizes a cultural and material expression. One would be commodity ecology, the material expression, and the other one is a civic democratic institution or cultural and now I will not describe those, but I will move forward uh, toward the conclusion. Um, so state-based spiralism, regionalism, I was arguing, is part of the ecological contract. In 
institutional polytopia to avoid the danger of a single ideological utopia or a single ideological interpretation of what is wrong and uh, the gatekeeping on any kind of green politics. This is the work of many different things that overlap. And the working definition of the biological state is this selective sense of autonomy, a polytopia to maintain uh, multiple places, a real places, instead of a singular ideological places that's nowhere. Uh, we humans, because of our ecological self-interest, yield a politics toward environmental moderation if it's allowed. However, this ecological self-interest is typically shielded from its expression by a various framework of gatekeeping. However, from polls, as I said, uh, political uh, demographics is indeed already here. They're waiting to be organized. Moving forward to the very last slide. I argue the main debate is here policy creation versus policy creation. Uh, we are living in the sixth dial of life on this planet, estimated to be much larger than others in the past due to our habitat destruction, both land and ocean. Unlike other dials, it's anthropogenic, humanly caused by, I argue, <coughs> fully representative developmentalism, despite being in the midst of a huge, currently disorganized uh, human political opposition to it. Ergo, we are living in an era of the largest social movement in history in organization support. Global environmentalism, the bioregional state aims to organize it, it allows for elites, just environmentally representative ones, it's not anti status it's pro status but the current organization of the state is the main issue to solve. Um, there is more about me if you'd like to hear a 30 minute interview, and thank you very much, or is this just the beginning? <laughs> Any immediate questions? <laughs> While well, Mark will be answering them, I would like to invite all the panel. Take your seat here for the final questions. If there are such things. any immediate questions? Um, my immediate question, Mark, is given the problems we've had overcoming the vested interest in the elite in addressing global climate change, how would you address the vested interest in the elite in uh, opposing the sort of what sounds like the ecologically and politically silent solution that you proposed. Well, that was the solution. I'm arguing that. Well, that was, how do you overcome the, the political interest of all the political forces? That was the idea. Um, the point is there are many ways that either a democratic structure or a non democratic structure to operate outside of regular politics, particularly the last two that I did not have much time to discuss were the commodity ecology, which was a grassroots organization, free market to help develop more uh, suitable materials for particular regions. Um, but the main point was that there's a durable long-term pattern, and whether it succeeds or not, I would argue that there's a great deal of regularity in the past framework of political corruption explaining the difficulty that you and I are both, I think, come to terms with, particularly in Copenhagen where your, your idea was, you know, they're going to develop these grand responsibilities, but one of the major premises that broke down that agreement was that the developed countries came to Copenhagen uh, with uh, the desire to remove those historical responsibilities.